The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Welcome back to Element 14 Presents. My name is DJ, and this is the mechanism of a rotary phone. You probably haven't used one of these in a while, if ever, and I wouldn't blame you. The technology is over a century old, and these haven't been mass produced in decades. But while this may be vintage technology, one thing that never goes out of style is good old fashioned feedback. Modern cell phones are nifty, but touchscreens just can't hold a candle to the click of an actual button or the feedback of an actual spring. So I'm gonna be giving this vintage piece of technology a modern life as a cell phone. One, because I can, and two, because I am going to win the California State Hipster Competition this year, and I think this is gonna be my shot. I'm really feeling it. Amazing hacks. Inspired designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. So how are we gonna turn this into this? Well, it's certainly not gonna be a rotary smartphone yet, but this isn't exactly my first rotary phone rodeo. See, back in 2016, I built this. This is my first working prototype of a rotary cell phone, or it's what's left of one. I ended up harvesting the parts for future projects. Thankfully, I don't do that anymore. So let's talk about what you actually need in addition to the rotary phone to make this work. Well, we'll need a GSM modem to talk to the cellular network. We'll need a microcontroller to talk to the GSM modem. We'll need some buttons for clicking. We'll need a power switch, a Wii Electret microphone, an 8 ohm speaker, an antenna for radio transmission and reception, a battery, and a display. Oh, and one more thing. Yes, you will need a SIM card in order to have cellular access. There's no free radio lunch, even when it comes to your own do-it-yourself cellular projects. I'm using Ting because they still offer 2G access. Yes, I still have 2G access in my region. Yes, it will eventually close down. That is okay because I'm not gonna be using this as my daily driver for a phone. I skipped over this in the Raspberry Pi phone build because mostly it just involves entering my personal information. Yes, you can use 3G modems, even 4G modems. They're more expensive, they're different. And I really can't help you if you have a particular SIM card. There are thousands. You need to contact your own wireless provider if you want to make cellular projects on your own time. All right, so let's take a look at the back of the rotary mechanism here. We've got some nice beefy tie points for the wires. And essentially all this is is three separate switches. So I'm gonna release the dial and we'll see what happens. So the switch on the right will rapidly open and close according to how far we turn the dial. The switch in the middle will latch shut while the dial's engaged. And the last switch on the left will open while the dial's engaged. Really, all we need is the switch on the right to count the number of pulses, which will turn into whatever number we want to dial. Although it might be nice to uh, read the state of one of these latching switches so we know exactly when the dial starts and when our dialing ends. So initially I talked about using this microcontroller and a separate GSM modem. That was a lie. I'm actually using the Phone of Feather, literally the same one from the Raspberry Pi phone because it's already integrated and I'm not using it for anything currently and it already has wire points, wire connections for the speaker and microphone. And here's the circuit, although it's a little bit uh, loose. So let's go make a case for it in order to make it easier to use.
All right, here we are in uh, 3D Land, also known as Fusion 360, my preferred CAD program. And here is the design for the case for the Rotocell, my rotary cell phone. It was designed to be relatively straightforward to put together. Most everything attaches to this main faceplate, which is uh, about 16th inch aluminum plate that I'll be CNC milling. So everything bolts to it. We've got the two buttons, a little slot for the microphone, a window for the OLED display, a grill for the speaker, and about five, well, not about, exactly five holes uh, to mount it to the body. And of course the dial uh, pops out from the rotary mechanism right here. I decided to keep the microphone up here because this means that the microphone wires themselves are a lot shorter, so there'll be uh, less chance for noise, some noise to couple to those lengthy microphone wires. So let's spin it around. Over here on the right, we've got a uh, cutout on the body for the power button and a window, or not window, a hole for the USB connection for the Fona Feather so that we can charge it and program it. On the back, we've got the base plate. So there are two main uh, components that will be 3D printed, the body itself and this base plate, which has two discs. One is a polycarbonate, or will be a polycarbonate window so that we can see the rotary mechanism. And up here, I've got a modified version of the Bell logo. I just tidied it up a bit and changed it because this is my own alternate history piece of technology and so the company no company logo will be an alternate history logo as well. So let me turn that off and we can hop on inside. So there's quite a bit of room so that it's easy to assemble. The speaker just rests in this bracket which uh, also uses the same screws, or at least two of the same screws for the screws that hold in the face plate. Other than that, the feather uh, will screw into these little posts on the base plate, and the rotary mechanism itself has two threaded locations so that I can screw that into the main body. Let me turn that back on. But other than that, it is surprisingly simple. I tried to keep this to a low part count, low screw count, uh, because I have a tendency to overcomplicate things and I'm trying to cut that out. All right, let's start making this real. And eventually, we get this. As you can see, I've left plenty of breathing room for the components and wires. I've learned my lesson about not leaving enough space to assemble everything. Now, for the next segment, I was going to just talk over the code to explain the operation, and you can still download it by going to the Element 14 community link in the description below. But rather than telling you how this works, why don't I just show you? All right, here she is, the Rotocell version three. So there's nothing necessary that we need to do on the back, but I did want to show it off in a bit more detail. Of course, we've got the nice engraved uh, modified version of the Bell logo. We've got the window for the rotary mechanism to show off that electromechanical goodness. Right here on the side, we've got the port for the USB connection so that we can charge the battery and of course reprogram it. Here's our power switch. There's no other interfaces on the side, just these grippy bits, grippy ridges. All right, so let's turn it on. So it'll flash its name, it'll scroll off, and it'll start connecting to the cellular network. All right, that's good. So it just flashed the power level because we don't have enough screen real estate to constantly show the battery level and that quick little net search that popped up that just tells us that it was connecting to the network and everything was A-OK. -okay. All right, so now we're in the main interface. We've got a nice little 
uh, command line style blinking cursor. And this is just an eight by two character uh, green OLED display. So I wanted to keep it really minimal so that it seems at least somewhat more plausible in an alternate history, but who cares? It's my alternate history, it can be whatever I want. All right, so if we dial a number, I'm just gonna dial two, it will play the DTMF tone right there via the speaker. Let me just keep dialing. And eventually we should reach, oh, yeah, reach the end, so. You can't enter uh, excessively long digits, so it's basically right now hard-coded for calling American phones. And I could just hit this red button to clear, oh, slash, how'd you, get a, how'd you get a slash? Interesting. So that will clear the display. Now, of course, the left button is our confirm button. So, you know, pick up whatever, confirm, okay. And here's our cancel, no hang up button on the right, just indicated by these two little pips. All right, so now I'm going to actually call myself. I'll do a area code reveal, but we'll blur out my entire phone number. So I'm just gonna set down my phone right here and then we'll go. Nine, oh, nine. Please leave your message for nine zero nine. Well, calling myself all fine and dandy, but I'm pretty hungry, so let's order a pizza with this. All right. Thanks. All right, looks good. I may need to tone down the volume a little bit. Hi, I'd like to place an order for delivery. Okay, sir. Uh, can I get a large uh, that is half and half? Sir, can I have your phone number? Right, that's uh, 909. Well, that about does it for myself and the rotary cell phone here. I'm pretty happy with how it turned out, although I'm pretty sure I'm gonna continue making versions of these in the future. Speaking of the future, if you've got a cool idea for something you'd like to see us make, let us know at element14.com forward slash suggestion box. Now, if you excuse me, I've got a pizza to eat. Mmm, they're so good.